<clears throat> Radigan is a Newman like Marika. Marika and Radigan are twins. Marika created Radigan. Radigan used to be a part of Marika. Marika was enslaved by Radigan. Radigan was enslaved by Marika. Radigan is a curse from the Fire Giants. Mikola and Melania are both clones. Marika tried to kill herself by breaking the Elden Ring. Radigan absorbed Marika. Marika absorbed Radigan. Radigan is Marika's secret identity. The Elden Beast pulled Radigan and Marika apart when he was creating the Sacred Reddick Sword. Renala and Radigan have a secret child. The Amber Egg is Renala and Radigan's secret child. Banal is Renala and Radigan's secret child. Godwin is Marika and Placidusax's secret child. Marika and Radigan are the alchemical Rebus. Radigan is a misbegotten. Radigan is the hero of Castle Morn. Marika is the Glomide Queen. Radigan is one of Marika's Shadowbound Beasts. Renala was the cuckoo all along and she's taken over Radigan's body. Radigan is still alive somewhere. Marika was bound to Radigan using extreme grafting. The Greater Will bound Radigan to Marika to keep her under control. Radigan is a big parasite made by the Greater Will. Radigan is Marika's mimic tier. Goldmine was going to burn the earth tree himself. Marika was originally a brunette, and of course, Radigan is an ant. These were just a few of the theories you guys shared with me on my first video. I was absolutely blown away that so many of you took the time to share them, and I never expected so many responses. Thank you to everyone, especially those who disagreed with the usurping theory, but still went out of your way to share such kind words. They've really meant the world, and all of your thoughts and theories are an amazing resource. They're also a testament to FromSoft's amazing method of world building for there to be such a wide variety of different ideas. One thing's for sure, after a year since Elden Ring's release, there still isn't a single unified theory within the community. Whether Radigan separated with Marika early on, whether they merged into one being after their marriage, or if they were never one being at all, the community is still undecided. And while the infinite scope of speculation is what draws many of us into the FromSoft games, at the moment it feels like we're still missing the full picture. As I expected, you guys pointed out many areas of the lore that I missed in the original video, so I want to follow up on these to try and progress this theory further. I'd highly recommend viewing the first part of this series if you haven't already, but if anyone out there still watches this video first, please let me know how crazy all this will sound. But as a summary, the usurping theory is an alternative interpretation to the message Radigan is Marika. It speculates that Radigan was sent to Lanedale by the Two Fingers to punish Marika for breaking the Elden Ring, and Radigan kept up a facade of order by pretending that Marika was still in control. In doing so, Radigan pretended to be Marika while she was locked inside the Earth Tree. Radigan is Marika because everything Marika did after shattering the Elden Ring was actually done by Radigan in disguise. I had so many great discussions with you guys in the comments, and from listening to you guys, I've been able to compile a list of all the most important issues with the usurping theory, and the key areas of the law I'll need to address for the theory to move forward. So in this video, I want to go through this list to help answer the questions you had for the theory. Thank you to all of you who shared your support and for explaining your thoughts in such amazing detail. Although I'm confident in the foundations for this theory, it must be said that I still could be wrong about many of the aspects of the law. Whilst going through the law and thinking about this theory, I've honestly felt that the usurping idea is able to provide a lot of answers to many of the mysteries we're still facing. At the moment, if anyone agrees with only certain aspects of this theory, I feel it's completely fair to take those points from this video and disregard the rest. Your own thoughts and theories are just as important as mine. So please let me know what areas of the video you agree with, and which areas you're still unconvinced. I've also gone through both the English and Japanese versions for the text for everything I'll cover in this video. I'll also link the translation spreadsheets I've been using, and a huge thank you to those in the Ward Discord community for helping me with lore and translation questions. The DeepL translator you guys directed me to was a great help. If I was stuck using only Google Translate, I'd definitely end up embarrassing myself. And again, a lot of my thoughts and theories have been heavily influenced by many other amazing content creators. Smoketown, The Tarnished Archaeologist, Zulu the Witch, Quay Lar, Garrulous Goldmask, Bandit Games, Mad Luigi, Sekiro Doobie, Agent Shake, The Law Hunter, Zeo Storm, Ratatoska, Lost Protagonist, Cosmos, and of course, Varty Vidya, have all been major inspirations for me. So you might recognise some of my approaches to the lore from their content, and I'll specifically link any of the amazing content that I'll talk about in this video. My videos are all about getting some ideas flowing, and it feels like there's a lot of interesting lore that just doesn't fit with the Radica theory. And as much of the game is still wildly confusing, simply strictly adhering to the Radica theory, in a way, prevents us from finding some of the overarching connections in the lore. So this is all for fun, and I'm hoping we get a lot of concrete answers when the Shadow of the Earth Tree drops. But with all that out of the way, let's start on this list of questions that you guys had for the usurping theory to try and address. 
So the most commonly raised issue by far with the timeline for the usurping theory was with Mikula and Godwin's apparent close relationship. As many of you pointed out, a lot of evidence is pointing towards them having known each other personally. Godwin might even have been a parental figure for Mikula and Melania, making his death even more tragic for the twins. If this were true, then most of the usurping theory couldn't even be possible. Specifically, if Radigan first went to Laindale to enact Marika's grim punishment for shattering the Elden Ring, then Godwin would have already been dead. So if the twins hadn't been born yet, obviously there would have been no chance for them to get to know each other. So I didn't bring up their implied relationship at all in the original video. And as it would mess up the whole timeline for the usurping theory, it really is something I should have included. The change in the timeline was based on the English and Japanese for some of Roger's dialogue, where he clearly says the Night of Black Knives happened during the Golden Age of the Earth Tree. And as he claims the Elden Ring closely follows Godwin's death, I was confident this was before Radigan was in Laindell. But this doesn't acknowledge the implied relationship between Mikula and Godwin, and many of you pointed me towards small details that I'd completely missed before. So there's definitely more to consider, so I'll begin by addressing the evidence found in the game that does imply Mikula and Godwin had a close relationship. As I'm sure you're well aware at this point, Barty Vidya's video on the lore of Mikula covers this evidence in amazing detail, so I would recommend giving that a second viewing. But the biggest piece of evidence is found within the description for the Golden Epitaph. A sword made to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden, the first of the demigods to die. Infused with the humble prayer of a young boy, O oh brother, Lord brother, please die a true death. With Mikula being forever cursed with an eternal childhood, and as it uses the Halig Tree sigil in its weapon skill, he is clearly the obvious candidate for the young boy. Many of you agreed that Mikula likely made this sword soon after Godwin's death, and for this to happen, Radigan and Marika must have already been together for the twins to be present at that time. And I think it's a fair assumption. For Mikula to have honoured Godwin in this way, I think it does make sense that they would have had a close personal bond. Now, alongside the Golden Epitaph, there's also evidence found in this particular statue. Located in the Halig Tree, it depicts Mikula and Melania as children being embraced by an adult figure, and there's been a lot of speculation for this mystery person being Godwin himself. Obviously, this would be very compelling evidence for Godwin having personally known and been close to the twins. And although I've tried to gather evidence for who the sculpture could be depicting, to be honest, it is still quite an anomaly. There's a further connection between Godwin and Mikula found in references to the Eclipse, which I'll get to for the second part of this video. So first, with the Golden Epitaph implying their close relationship, there's a few points I'd like to mention. Points that suggest the sword was both made long after Godwin's death, and call into question that it is implying a close relationship. First, we all know from the incantations that Mikula shared with Radigan that he was definitely a fundamentalist for a time. And, we also know that Golden Order Fundamentalism was the principal force against those who live in death, who were all directly spawned from Godwin's death route. Those who live in death fall outside the principles of the Golden Order. Their mere existence sullies the guidance of gold, tainting its truth. And so it is, the vermin must be exterminated. Down to the very last. While Mikula was a fundamentalist, fighting against those who live in death would have certainly been an objective for him as well, and attempting to give Godwin a proper death would certainly put an end to the spread of death route. It also sounds like the perfect Herculean task for a prodigy such as Mikula. Apart from looking extra fancy, using the sword will prevent those who live in death from rising again after killing them. Those who live in death were all born from Godwin's death route, which spread after Godwin's soulless corpse was interred within the roots of the earth tree. So it's also fair to presume that Mikula was praying for Godwin's true death to put an end to both his suffering and to put an end to the spread of his death route. The location of the Golden Epitaph is very interesting to me as well. As Abuza pointed out, it's just sort of hidden away on a random corpse in Arise's hero's grave. This dungeon is filled with basilisks that spit death blight at us, skeletal militiamen who live in death, more basilisks spitting out more death blight, an omen that even spits out death blight, and then a load more basilisks. With the sword being found around so many enemies relating to the spread of Godwin's death route, it does seem that whoever died wielding the golden epitaph was doing so for defence against this spread. It makes sense that Mikula created the sword to specifically aid in this purpose, but as the death route stemmed from Godwin's soulless body after it was interred in the roots of the earth tree, it would have taken time for the death route to spread throughout the lands between. So if Mikula made the sword soon after Godwin's death, then the spread of death route had yet to happen there wouldn't have been a need for him to create weapons and incantations with the power to later rest those who live in death. 
I feel this is a strong argument for the golden epitaph being made long after Godwin's death. Admittedly, this doesn't mean Mikola and Godwin couldn't have had an early kinship, but at the very least, I think it being made a long while after his death does weaken the idea that it was done so as an emotional response from Mikola, and as such, I think this weakens the idea that they were particularly close. Looking now at the rest of its description, it tells us that Mikola made the sword to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden. The sword being created for a commemoration by Mikola indicates to me that the sword was made for a more formal intention. We can see from its high level of ornamentation that it represents a more ceremonial or ritualistic purpose, and the word commemoration is typically used to describe paying respects to an event of the past. And lastly, the phrasing of Mikola's prayer appears quite cold and distant. Calling Godwin Lord Brother feels much more reverential than familial. That said, the phrase O Brother, Lord Brother is translated from the Japanese Ni Sama. To my knowledge, this is just the respectful word for brother, so it seems like quite the leap to calling your brother Lord. Although this could be argued to be hinting at a distance between Mikola and Godwin, it is equally plausible for Mikola to have reverence and respect towards him, especially if he really was a strong father figure for the twins. So this doesn't really help my case, as it can be argued for either I think. But with all this in mind, I have to disagree that the golden epitaph was made soon after the Knight of Black Knives and Godwin's death. And in actuality, I don't think the sword gives us much evidence for an early kinship between Mikola and Godwin. Its description just doesn't seem like strong evidence for an implied close relationship. I think it makes more sense that Mikola would have created the golden epitaph just to commemorate his brother's death. And the reason for doing so was, in part, to seek an end to both the spread of Godwin's death route and to fight against those who live in death. And as Mikola is often characterised as quite the compassionate individual, and as Godwin's body looks pretty miserable, I think it's only natural for Mikola to yearn for his brother's suffering to end. Now, there's still the statue in the Halig Tree. Many people have investigated this statue, and have reached the conclusion that the person likely depicted with the twins here is Godwin. Well, the statue's delicate crown is noticeably different from those worn by Marika and Radigan, there's no hint of a bosom suggesting it's not Marika, and they have wavy unbraided hair, which is very different from Radigan's. There has always been a signature hair braid in all depictions of Radigan America, so it would be unusual for this statue to depict either of them without it. It's almost impossible to compare the statue with Godwin, as there's sadly very few depictions of him in the game. We only have one still from the intro cinematic, where Godwin has beachy wavy long hair, the shots in the story trailer of Godwin post Shank with more silky smooth hair, and lastly, Godwin's malformed mermaid body, which still has vestiges of long matted blonde hair. Comparing these is very tricky. In my opinion, the closest match to the statue is in the story trailer, showing Godwin's straight blonde hair, but none of these show him wearing a crown at all, let alone the one he wears in the statue. To me, this crown is very similar to the ones worn by Melania and Mikola in their statues. As an aside, it's interesting how different Mikola's hair is depicted here from the intro cinematic, where the undulating crown he wears is sort of similar to his intricate hair braids. And these unique braids are a perfect match to the mysterious individual in the Shadow of the Earth Tree poster, which is very compelling for this person being Mikola. But again, both differ a lot, so I feel this helps the idea that the hair in the statues isn't a great identifier. Another quick side note, it really confuses me that Radigan has blonde hair in all of his statues. This is the same one in the capital that transforms into Marika, so I could argue that this shows Radigan slipping in his disguise in front of the sculptor, like he forgot to turn off the blonde and the sculptor noticed. It's more likely FromSoft just being inconsistent, but again, here we see the statues aren't always accurate. Anyway, whilst the Halig Tree statue could be hinting towards Godwin being close to the twins, I have to argue that this is just speculation at this point. We do know that Radigan did have a close relationship with Mikola, from the fundamentalist incantations they were sharing with each other. But while I've been trying to find any clues, I haven't yet found anything that gives more information on who this individual is. Personally, I'm interested in FromSoft's choice of putting these red leaves creeping over the trio. The red colour could be symbolising the Scarlet Rot, if the figure on the left is Melania. Similarly, the red colour could be symbolising the parentage of Radigan, if the adult figure is indeed Radigan. Or, this could be nothing at all. FromSoft has been conditioning us to search for meaning in every small detail, but I've not seen anyone mention these red leaves before. In any case, we simply can't confirm who this individual is. I feel there's equal argument for either Radigan or Godwin, but we can't know for certain. Sorry to Varty Vidya, as I know this theory is a particular favourite of his, and the fan art for Godwin caring for the twins has been really incredible. 
so I hope I won't be upsetting anyone by casting doubt on the statue depicting Godwin. But all in all, after going through the fine details for the golden epitaph and the Halig Tree statue, I am still unconvinced they are hinting towards a strong emotional connection between Mikula and Godwin. I don't think Mikula would have needed a close relationship with Godwin for him to wish him a true death. And to me, there's a strong implication that the Golden Epitaph was made long after the Night of Black Knives, once the death route had spread and given rise to those who live in death. At the very least, even if they did have a relationship, I don't think this is evidence for them being particularly close. The Eclipse is the other area of the lore that implies a connection between Godwin and Mikula. The foundation of this revolves around Mikula's apparent plans to restore Godwin's soul via a ritual involving an eclipse. There are very few, very small mentions of the eclipse in the lore, and there are truly no actual explanations or any details of what this supposed ritual would even involve. With so little information, it's not really an area I felt confident to speculate on, but many of you have seen a connection between Mikula and restoring Godwin's soul, which would indicate a pretty strong connection. So I'll try and detail this connection, but I want to underline that we can't know for sure, unless more details are explained in the DLC that is. But going forward, I think the key question to keep in mind is, if Mikula was trying to restore Godwin's soul, why would he want to do so in the first place? So mention of an eclipse is reserved for a handful of weapons and talking spirits. First, there's the Eclipse Crest Heater Shield. The sun in eclipse is said to be the symbol of the wandering mausoleums, where the soulless demigods slumber. These mausoleums are found across the lands between, and they house the bodies of the other soulless demigods. Although it's never confirmed, I think these are likely the demigods that fell after Godwin during the Night of Black Knives. We learn here that the sun in eclipse is meant to be the symbol for these mausoleums, and they are often guarded by mausoleum knights. These knights have decapitated themselves to follow their masters into death. Some of them carry the Eclipse Crest Great Shield, which tells us that the eclipsed sun, drained of colour, is the protective star of the soulless demigods. It aids the mausoleum knights by keeping destined death at bay. So, these knights are protecting their soulless masters inside the mausoleums by keeping destined death at bay. And, the eclipse is both the symbol of the mausoleums and a protective star that somehow aids the knights in protecting them. I've heard people say the phrase protective star might be implying an outer god of some kind, but there's no other mention of a protective star to work with, so I've not got much to add to that. But to me, the purpose of the knights keeping destined death at bay means two things. First, they are stopping the soulless bodies from truly dying, hoping that their souls can one day be restored. This is supported by the spirit ashes for the leader of the Mausoleum Knights, Luta the Headless, who sacrificed her life so that, in death, she could continue to protect a soulless demigod until the revival, earning her the hero's honour of Erdtree Burial. As an aside, it's interestingly a bit unclear if she earned Erdtree Burial because her master had already been resurrected, or if her sacrifice alone earned her this right. The Japanese for her spirit ashes seems to imply more firmly that they had been resurrected. I don't know to be honest, as it's never mentioned again. Maybe one of Godfrey's ancestors were resurrected, and maybe this made them so weak they used grafting to regain power. With such little detail, we have to remember to be careful in seeking meaning where there truly isn't evidence to back it up, no matter how fun it is. But back to keeping Destin Death at bay, I think it also means the act of preventing the spread of death root from the soulless bodies. Just as Godwin did when he was buried at the roots of the Erd Tree, surely the other bodies have the potential to spread death root as well. And maybe, after interring Godwin failed to put his body to rest, and it began the spread of death root through the roots of the Erd Tree, they could have learned to isolate the bodies instead inside the mausoleums. This would explain exactly why they are present in the lands between, and why the knights continue to protect them. They are preventing anyone from tampering with the bodies, which could spread destined and death further through more death root. So how does this relate to Mikula? Well, we know that he was a fundamentalist, and we also know he was an amazing prodigy. It makes sense that Mikula was using his intellect and skill to try and put an end to the spread of death root, and that means he was trying to solve the problem of Godwin's soulless corpse. It's crucial that the symbol of the eclipse is said to have aided this endeavour, but we simply aren't told how. Well, we can learn more about the eclipse itself within Castle Sol. The place is covered with eclipse crests, and at its centre we find the Church of the Eclipse, where we find a spooky talking ghost. O great sun, frigid sun of soul, surrender yourself to the eclipse. Grant life to the soulless bones. And at the top of the castle, looking down over the halig tree, we can find another spooky ghost calling out to Mikola himself. Lord Mikola, forgive me, the sun has not been swallowed. Our prayers were lacking. Your comrade remains soulless. I will never set my eyes upon it now. Your divine halig tree. 
Here's the big connection between Mikola and some sort of eclipse restoring life back to the solace. It undeniably links them together, but it is the only mention of granting life to the solace in the entire game. A few lines from two ghosts inside Castle Sol. One hinting that the sun surrendering to the eclipse would grant life to the solace, and one asking for Mikola to forgive him for the sun not being swallowed and for his comrade remaining soulless. I think these two spirits provide all of the speculation that the eclipse is a ritual to restore Godwin's soul. We can infer from these two spirits that the swallowing of the sun might have been an actual event, and we can infer it might have restored a soul to someone. This link is undeniable, but we do not have anything else to work with. We can try and break down the text to analyse this link, and from this I've been having thoughts on the phrase, the sun has not been swallowed. Whilst it's fair to read this as an eclipse that never happened, I've always thought the phrase could alternatively be more of a metaphor. If the eclipse is the symbol that aged the mausoleum knights in keeping destined death at bay, then it represents the sealing of destined death. So if the sun in the eclipse means sealing destined death, then the sun not being swallowed could describe destined death not being sealed. If sealing away death and death was the goal, then it clearly hasn't happened. The spread has not been prevented. And as a fundamentalist, Mikola wanted to contain the spread of death and death, which has clearly failed. This is how I've always thought about it. But again, with such little to go on, all of your opinions are just as valid as mine. The last mention of the Eclipse is found within the legendary weapon for Castle Sol, the Eclipse Châtel. Storied sword and treasure of Castle Sol that depicts an eclipsed sun drained of colour. In Sol, the sight of an eclipse inspires a dreadful awe, preventing an onlooker from averting his gaze. This reinforces the eclipse being an event that actually happens in the lands between, but doesn't explain what's so terrifying about it. But the unique skill for the Châtel is very interesting to me. Casting imbues the blade with the Prince of Death's flames, inflicting the death ailment upon foes. Attacks inflict death blight on enemies, and casting a second time will trigger a death blight explosion. Somehow, it's captured Godwin's death blight and can draw it out. Harnessing the Prince of Death's flames would be a powerful tool, and it solidifies the connection between the Eclipse and sealing Godwin's spread of death root. And it also means all the enemies we face that are spitting out death blight are harnessing the Prince of Death's flames. This links them all to Godwin, as he is called the Prince of Death by Fia in her questline. How and why the Shotel is able to call forth these flames could be very important. With no other apparent connection to Godwin, it seems to me that this weaponized symbol of the Eclipse can contain and utilize the Death Blight Flames for its wielder. It has sealed destined death, able to call it forth at will. Again, we have such little information on the topic, so we can't speculate too much really, and there are so many questions remaining. How could the Eclipse restore souls? Why was half of the Halig Tree secret medallion kept at Castle Sol? Is there another outer god of the Eclipse? And how is the Eclipse Chattel able to utilize Death Blight? And what is the Frigid Son of Sol? Is there a cold sun especially for Castle Sol? Is this the regular tiny sun that we see? And is Godwin actually Mikola's soulless comrade? Could this be referring to a different soulless individual? As a side note on this last question, I'd like to mention Cosmos, who is an amazing lore explorer with some wild speculative content. In one of his videos, he pointed out that the armor worn by Ensha mentions an ancient lord, the soulless king, the lord of the lost and desperate. They are only ever referred to in this armor set, and apart from the slumbering demigods, they are the only other being labelled as soulless. Now, there are a few one-off mentions of unique characters throughout Elden Ring. FromSoft clearly enjoy hinting towards plotlines they never intend to, or never had time to explore further. But Cosmos argues that maybe this soulless king could have been Mikla's own royal consort. As an Empyrean, Mikla would have needed a consort to become a god, and there is never one mentioned for him in the game. This is definitely wild, but some really fun speculation. And with so little information to work with, this idea could tie the Soulless King into the narrative in a cool way. But that's all I think I can say on this one. There's too much mystery for us to say we know for certain the details surrounding Mikola's connection to the Eclipse. And while I can't deny that Mikola might have wanted to use the Eclipse to restore Godwin's soul, I'm not sure this would even imply that they had a close relationship. Mikola wouldn't have needed a close bond with Godwin to wish him a true death. And, as I concluded in the last chapter of this video, I don't think this area of the lore implies that they knew each other personally. To me, the Eclipse has more of a role in sealing the soulless demigods, preventing the spread of death root and destined death. But there may be more to this that I've missed completely, so if I have, please let me know. It'll hopefully be explored in the DLC, and I'll keep looking at this area of the lore to try and find any more solid answers. 
But that wraps up the questions for Mikula having a close relationship with Godwin. I know a lot of you agreed that this was the main big problem for the usurping theory, but now I hope you'll agree that there's a good foundation for doubting that Mikula and Godwin knew each other. I am still conflicted, as the artwork of Mikula and Godwin is really amazing. And I know Varti Vidya has based a fair few videos on this theory, but I hope I've made a strong enough argument for moving Godwin's death back to before Radigan went to Laindell, and I really hope I've shown that it is viable in the law. I think both arguments for and against their relationship do work, and both do make intuitive sense. So at this point, I can't deny that with all the mystery surrounding Mikula, it's fair if you simply prefer one theory over the other. For me, it's more intuitive that Mikula would have wanted to stop the spread of Godwin's death route during his time as a fundamentalist. At the very least, it's still up for interpretation at this time. Again, if there's any other factors that I've missed, please let me know. I think I've covered most of the lore here, but I'll be more than happy to go over anything you guys point out in another video. Many of you asked the question, why would Radigan impersonate Marika instead of just ruling over Laindale himself? Well, as I tried to explain in my first video, I think Radigan and the Two Fingers would have needed to keep the appearance of normality after he usurped Marika. The order was heavily weakened by the shattering of the Elden Ring after all. Ensuring continued worship of Marika would help them re-strengthen it. The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. While I think this would have been the main reason for Radigan choosing to pose as Marika, there are other reasons that could have potentially contributed. For one, there could have been a technicality, or a specific reason why Radigan wasn't suitable to take Marika's place as God of the Golden Order. All Imperians have been a female so far, so maybe being a male just isn't suitable. Well, Mikula was an Imperian of course, but maybe even he was transitioning inside of his cocoon into Saint Trina. Alternatively, the Two Fingers might have not wanted to end the current age, as has happened when gods have been usurped in the past. It would have led to a period of great change, and although the Golden Order would probably have survived this transition, it could have been too risky for them in their weakened state. This is just me speculating, so I can't say why they didn't just make Radigan the new god, but as a loyal fundamentalist, I'm sure Radigan would have preferred to simply stick to Marika being the one true god. So, as the Two Fingers would have been the one to send Radigan to Laindell to usurp Marika, they would, of course, always have known that she had long been shackled in the Earth Tree. They would also want to keep up the facade of order and the status quo, as they are the ones in the position of highest power, and it gives them the opportunity to strengthen their hold over the lands between by implementing fundamentalism as the ruling form of worship. I will admit, this might all seem like a leap of logic, so I've been thinking of the best way of describing why this idea is so intuitive to me, and I think the best way in doing so would be to talk about the Erdtree. Tree. I've always been very interested in the speculation that the Erdtree Tree itself might actually be a golden shade of an original ancient tree. The tarnished archaeologist covers this idea in brilliant detail. I'd highly recommend viewing his content if you haven't already. But as a summary, he points out several elements around Laindell that suggest the Erdtree Tree is really just a giant phantom. The huge amounts of ash, and the gold wax sealing it out of the windows and doorways, tells us there was another previous cataclysm within the city, one that happened long before we arrived in the Lands Between. Interestingly, the dark strike over the entrance of the Earth Tree is actually made of a different type of wood. When I first saw it, I just thought it was a shadow cast by some sort of scar, like a large split or hollow running up the trunk. But, thanks to Sekiro Doobie's amazing footage of the Earth Tree, we can see the clear separation of materials. And, as the non-golden wood can be seen all the way at the top of the tree, this honestly could be the remains of an original tree. At night we can see this more clearly. If this really is all we see of the original tree, then most of the air tree is actually a golden facade. This would be a similar allusion to the smaller trees that the golden seas describe as illusory. Sekiro Dubi also points out these golden threads on the higher branches. It's as though creeping vines are growing all over the old tree. I personally think these are very convincing indicators of an original tree hiding beneath its golden facade. And as the tarnished archaeologist suggests, this phantom of the Erd Tree is very similar to the golden shade of Godfrey that we fight in the Erd Tree Sanctuary. So I mention the illusory nature of the Erd Tree because it ties in really well to an allegory I was planning to include in my original video. It involves Dark Souls, Gwyndolin, and the city of Anor Londo, so spoilers ahead for anyone who is yet to play the first Dark Souls. When we meet one of the most memorable characters in the game, Guinevere, the Princess of Sunlight, she gives us the task of succeeding Lord Gwyn. However, in reality, 
Guinevere is just an illusion created by her younger brother Gwendolyn. If you attack her, Gwendolyn will denounce you and dispel an illusion he's cast over the entirety of Anor Londo. Thou that tarnishest the Godmother's image, I am Gwendolyn, and thy transgression shall not go unpunished. Thou shalt perish in the twilight of Anor Londo. He reveals the entire city is dark and desolate, caught in the dying twilight of Gwyn's Age of Fire, a far cry from the bright splendour we see on our first arrival. Gwyndolin created a facade over the entire city, bathing it in golden rays of sunlight. And, in a similar manner, the Erd Tree also has its own shining golden facade, giving off the impression of splendour and life. This is also a far cry from the stories of the divine benefits the Erd Tree once produced. As such, I feel it can be argued that the Erd Tree mirrors the illusion of Anor Londo. At the very least, I think the idea of a false facade surrounding Lanedale isn't an unimaginable concept for FromSoft to use. I want to be clear, just because FromSoft has a habit of repeating certain thematic elements in the game, like dragons and their stony scales, it doesn't mean this is definitely happening here as well. I just want to emphasise that the concept of a grand illusion taking place to give the appearance of continued virility is something FromSoft has explored in the past, so it wouldn't be outlandish if this were reflected within Elden Ring. And I think there are many similarities between Anor Londo and the Erdtree. We are told many times of the splendour the Erd Tree once had. Its blessed drops of sap were once bestowed personally by Queen Marika many years ago, and the sacred tears of the Erd Tree, once a potent blessing, are now only faint vestiges. And thanks to the steep decline in its bounties, we are told that the Erd Tree now serves only as a mere object of faith. It is merely a symbol of worship for the Golden Order. I think this decline could tie into both Marika shattering the Elden Ring and her disappearance from the Lands Between. That said, it is implied to have happened a very long time ago, so this decline could still have happened during Godfrey's era. But now, with the diminished bounties of the Erdtree, it has become an object of faith. And the Erdtree becoming an object of faith ties in really well with fundamentalism coming into the picture. As fundamentalism forbids anything that challenges the principles of the Golden Order, calling them acts of heresy and blasphemy, all potential opposing forces to the Erdtree are completely blocked from taking root. And this draconian ideology is a huge departure from the original liberal approach of the Golden Order. Fascinating, isn't it? That the Golden Order was pliable enough to absorb practices that contradicted itself in the past. With the Order broken, twisted and in need of repair, such adaptability is more important now than ever. I'm very interested in how Queen Marika's own search for a deeper meaning within the Golden Order aligns with the more traditional ideology. I declare mine intent, to search the depths of the Golden Order. Her own doubts about the Order go completely against fundamentalism. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. I don't think Marika ever agreed with fundamentalism, so to me it makes more sense that fundamentalism was established after Marika had disappeared. Within the usurping theory, this ties perfectly with Radigan arriving in Lanedell and becoming the second Elden Lord. So I think it's safe to say that fundamentalism is a separate form of worship from Marika's own ideology. Instead, as it's heavily associated and practiced by Radigan, it's intuitive that fundamentalism is likely Radigan's own form of religious practice. To solidify their power and ensure no one could ever question the Golden Order again, the Two Fingers wanted a faithful follower, a leal hound, to become the ruler of the lands between and establish fundamentalism. And the propagation of strict fundamentalism really would guarantee that no one could question the Golden Order ever again. This transition from a firm but malleable ideology to a dogmatic autocratic rule over the lands between would need to maintain the image of Marika as the one true god. Even though she has to be punished by being locked in the air tree, this transgression cannot be publicly known. The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. This really is the cornerstone of the Golden Order. Public knowledge of Marika's punishment for breaking the Elden Ring would shake the foundations of the entire faith. So it makes sense to me that a facade of order, with Marika's image remaining untarnished by her crimes, would be the most beneficial to the Order. Additionally, it gives them the opportunity to implement fundamentalism, putting an end to any other potential forces that oppose the Erdtree. The everlasting prosperity and divinity of the Erdtree is another certainty of the Golden Order or as Corin puts it, the culmination of perfection. 
both of these tenets would have to be enshrined as fact for Radigan to maintain the status quo. As such, keeping a bright golden phantom Erd tree with the appearance of glory and splendour actually turns it into a tool that aids maintaining the facade of prosperity and normality, just like Gwendolyn's illusion over Anor Londo. It's not Radigan himself creating the phantom Erd tree, but rather, the facade is created through the Elden Ring. This can be seen through the different forms of the Erd tree depending on how we repair the Elden Ring at the end of the game. In the Age of Fracture, the Erd tree returns undamaged by the Flame of Ruin, in a familiar condition with leaves continuing to fall. With Dung Eater's Mending Rune, the Erd tree is completely barren, devoid of colour and any leaves. With Fear's Mending Rune, a world of death restored, through all the pesky soot, the golden canopy has been restored, with a golden tinge to the tree. And in the Age of Order, with Goldmask's Mending Rune protecting the Elden Ring from any further interference, the Erd tree is blazing with golden light. Even the central scar around its entrance has some glimmer back, and the leaves are no longer falling. From the different endings, we know the Elden Ring defines the form of the Erd Tree, and the Erd Tree we know while playing through the game is maintained by Radigan and the Elden Beast. Their Erd Tree can no longer create the blessings it granted when Marika was actually ruling during the Golden Age. Finally, I'll add that maintaining a fake world with Radigan pretending that Marika is still in control would help explain the general stagnancy and decline of the Lands Between. It could be argued that the shattering of the Elden Ring began this decline, and the warring demigods certainly royally screwed up many parts of the world. But if Marika breaking the Elden Ring was followed by Radigan shackling her in the Earth Tree, then I feel her absence would lead to a decline felt by the whole world. So yeah, I hope you'll agree that the motives for Radigan and the Two Fingers maintaining the status quo do make sense. And I think Nico Gern put it best? Radigan pretending to be Marika also mirrors how Anolondo has one god ruling as another. Just as Gwyndolin maintained the image of Guinevere ruling over Anolondo, due to her being a more suitable figurehead, continued worship of Marika would definitely be needed for Radigan to implement Golden Order fundamentalism. I think this theory goes pretty far in providing an understanding of why the world is the way it is, but I'm sure I've left out details many of you want answers to for this, and there are other questions on this topic that I won't have time to answer in this video. So again, please let me know of any points and any bits of lore you'd like to go over. Many people disagreed with the theory that Goldmask's discovery of Radigan usurping Marika led to his apparent blasphemous thoughts. Although this would explain why his thoughts are going against Golden Order principles, many of you had many other theories for what his heretical ideas could have been. And that's completely fair, we can't know for certain what Goldmask is thinking, we only have the interpretations from Corin. The idea that Goldmask was instead cataloguing the history of the Golden Order was pretty popular. Here, Goldmask would have gotten stumped by Radigan's untraceable origins. This would work with his mathematical approach, but I personally have to disagree. I really don't feel this idea takes into account everything from the rest of their questline. Specifically, I think Corrin's use of the term holism is very important to understand how Goldmask's thoughts are heretical. The rhythms and calculus of the Master's finger betray a suspicion of the holism of the Golden Order, a conceit, I am afraid, that cannot be overlooked. According to Google, Holism is the theory that every individual component of a system is only understandable when it is looked at in relation to the entire system as a whole. If you take a component out of a system, it no longer makes any sense as an individual idea. And as each component would be incomprehensible when viewed away from the entire system, then the entire system is greater than the sum of its parts. So, taking out one component makes that component incomprehensible, and the system that is left over is also much weaker. So what could Goldmask questioning the holism of the Golden Order be referring to? Well, using this definition, I viewed Goldmask as taking one principle out of the Golden Order. This would make the Golden Order weaker, and the removed principle would make no sense on its own. As I said in the last video, as Corin mentions only one principle in particular, I think it is likely this principle that Goldmask is questioning. Corin even brought up this principle in the same paragraph as Radigan's name appearing. The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. However, the name of Marika's second husband, King Consort Radigan, also appeared. Who exactly was Radigan? The Master is stumped. His finger has remained still ever since Radigan's name was discovered. If Marika had long been shackled in the Erd Tree, then Radigan was the real god in control of the Golden Order. 
Radigan ruling the Golden Order, whilst Marika is no longer in control, would certainly challenge this principle to its core. This explains how Goldmask is questioning the holism of the Golden Order, and this also works with his mathematical and logical approach. From a game narrative perspective, Corin mentioning this principle alongside Radigan's name appearing helps to make this a more intuitive progression of their questline. Narrative is particularly important to me, as I love the art of storytelling and narrative creation, and I believe this theory definitely works with the lore and, I think, is a more satisfying progression and conclusion. So I think holism is important as FromSoft have a history of choosing their words carefully. They are often discrepancies between the English and Japanese, so both must be taken into account to find the true intentions of the dialogue. On the Japanese, it appears the questioning of the holism of the Golden Order is translated from questioning the integrity of the Golden Order. Calling the Golden Order's holism into doubt is certainly questioning its integrity, and the word holism might just be describing this in a more specific way. Radigan ruling as Marika would make him the god of the Golden Order, and again it directly conflicts with the principle of Marika being the one true god. For the Japanese of Corin mentioning this principle, Corin says the Golden Order is the law that makes Queen Marika the one god. The use of the term law stands out to me, and in the context of Goldmask's thoughts later being heretical to Corin, it again seems likely that this was the law Goldmask was going against. But I'm not 100% confident on these translations, so if anyone could help with translating this part of the dialogue, it would be a huge help. But yeah, taking into account the entirety of Corin's dialogue actually gives us a lot to work with and I really think we should be trying to use all the information FromSoft has given us. I hope you guys will also find this a more interesting progression of their questline. I know a popular theory is Goldmask was simply thinking the Golden Order isn't perfect in general. I can't deny this is a very valid possibility, for we aren't able to know for certain what Goldmask is thinking. Again, this would fit the narrative, but I think it completely departs from the progression of their questline, and disregards most of the dialogue. Similarly, many have said that Goldmask could simply be questioning the role of the capricious gods. His mending rune does make his thoughts on the Golden Order pretty clear, and such thoughts alone would upset the fundamentalist Corrin. So now, let's move on to talking about Goldmask's mending rune. At the end of the questline, we find the mending rune of perfect order. I feel we really must view this mending rune with all of the questline. It is the conclusion Goldmask has reached from all his contemplations on the Golden Order. A rune of transcendental ideology, which will attempt to perfect the Golden Order. The current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of gods no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment. The imperfection of the Golden Order is the result of the fickleness of gods no better than men. And a huge part of this conclusion comes directly from Goldmask learning the message Radigan is Marika. When added to the Elden Ring, the Mending Rune would act as a barrier around it, protecting it from being changed or abused by the gods for their own desires ever again. His transcendental ideology is that the Elden Ring is more important than any single individual, human or god. The Japanese for the Mending Rune has a different phrasing to describe the fickleness of the gods, and I found two slightly different translations. There is no need for a man like mindful God, and, like a man, God with a heart is unnecessary. To me, this is telling us that Goldmask blames the instability of the Golden Order on the human like reactions of the gods. It was the emotional responses of Marika and Radigan that were to blame. The word gods plural means he regarded all gods as fickle. Radigan's actions were in some way fickle alongside Marika's. So, beginning with Marika, what emotional response could he be referring to? The most clear event would be the shattering of the Elden Ring. It does seem like a drastic and emotional response from Marika, and as Minyane suggested, she could have been trying to use the Elden Ring as a means to restore Godwin's soul and bring him back to life. It's obvious when you think about it, but Marika was likely completely devastated by her son's murder. Marika is always called the Eternal God Queen, and maybe we forget how extreme her grief must have been. Her son would have been the first real loss for her and it could have understandably led to her shattering the Elden Ring in her attempts to bring Godwin back. This event is clearly stated to go against the Two Fingers, and it is the reason they demanded she face punishment. It also appears like an emotional event in the trailer, and Rani claimed Marika was driven to the brink by the Knight of Black Knives. So if it was an emotional reaction out of grief, it could certainly be called an erratic, fickle thing to do. She plunged the whole world into chaos, giving her real Cersei vibes. Now for Radigan being fickle, I think we need to look into his later actions. I personally have the suspicion that he went a bit rogue at some point, 
going from following the bidding of the Two Fingers to refusing to relinquish his position as Elden Lord. The tragic corruption of the Order has taken its toll. We know the Two Fingers are completely dependent on champions to do their bidding, and they have a history of replacing their champions if they ever begin to disobey them. For example, we see the baleful shadows they send for Rani after she refused to be their Empyrean. Furthermore, we know the Church Confessors were assassins working for the Two Fingers. Led by Crepus, they would hunt down the Tarnished that strayed from Grace. We find his Black Key crossbow hidden in the Round Table hold, as well as the Assassin's Prayer Book, and the Creeper's Vile Talisman would have helped them hide in the shadows. So, Radigan's refusal to give up being Elden Lord would also explain why the Greater Will extended Grace to the Tarnished. Radigan ultimately failed to repair the Elden Ring, and the realm has fallen into decay. We were the last candidates left to succeed him and repair the Elden Ring. After all, the Two Fingers specifically ask us to become Queen Marika's consort. Confer great runes to become Elden Lord and join Queen Marika as her consort. The Fingers have willed it so. If Radigan knew they wanted him gone, it feels like a very human and emotional thing for him to lock up the Erdry. A last-ditch defiant act of rebellion. A refusal to give up his position. Again, the Two Fingers themselves are powerless if their champions don't follow their orders. And this would be why our Two Fingers froze inside the Round Table Hole. We were their final option to complete Radigan's objective, the one he failed to accomplish. But they are completely bamboozled by Radigan locking up the Erdtree. They clearly didn't expect him to pull this move, and they clearly have no answer for it. The only way forward is to burn the earth tree, and naturally, they would rather continue the facade of order that they helped implement over helping to commit the first cardinal sin. I really think this way of looking at things provides a good explanation for Goldmask's mending rune. The emotional reactions of both Marika and Radigan were the failure of the Golden Order. Their human emotions were the fickleness of gods no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment. I hope this all makes sense, and I will admit, I'm speculating a lot on what Goldmask's mid-air braille writing could be, but I think this theory is more narratively satisfying, which is important to me, even if it's ultimately a bit inconsequential. But I think holism is a very important term for Corrin to use, so I'd love to know what you guys think of the whole holism implications. User Make Total Destroy asked how Melina's story would fit into the usurping theory. And this is a great question I wish I had time to explore in my original video. So to start with Melina, we absolutely don't know her origins for certain. But personally, I am convinced she is the child of Radigan and Marika. The butterflies alone are very convincing, with the three species potentially representing all of their children. Two of them are definitely representing the twins, the nascent butterfly for Michaela and the Aeonian butterfly for Melina. The third species, the smouldering butterfly, ties in really well with Melina's role as the kindling maiden. So this symbology is linking all three of them together, and the obvious link would be that they are all Radigan and Marika's children. However, Melina has long been suspected to be the Glomide Queen. If she were, then she couldn't be Radigan's daughter, as the Glomide Queen was defeated at the dawn of the Golden Order. But as we know Melina is the kindling maiden, I personally don't think she would also be the Glomide Queen. Within the usurping theory, if Radigan chained up Marika as soon as he arrived in Laindale, that would very sadly mean that, like the twins, Melina would have been born under the same Game of Thrones-esque conditions. I'd like to correct something I said in the original video, and I personally think she would also essentially be dead at this point, just as a vessel for the Elden Ring. I think I was a bit too extreme here, as it makes more sense that Marika retained her consciousness during her imprisonment. But anyway, this awful situation for Melina's birth would tie in really well with a small piece of her dialogue regarding Bok. Your seamster, Bok. I see him crying from time to time. I think he misses his mother. He wants someone to tell him he's beautiful. Does being born of a mother mean one behaves in such a manner? This is very interesting to me. We know Melina has a mother, as it was her who gave Melina her purpose. I was born at the foot of the Erd Tree, where Mother gave me my purpose. So then, why would Melina be unaware of what a relationship would be like with her mother? Well, if Marika was locked in the Erd Tree for all of her life, then she wouldn't have experienced anything close to a proper relationship with her. When we finally get to the capital, she leaves us to investigate the task she was given. 
We don't know where she goes, but we can summon her before the fight with Morgoth, the last person standing in the way of the entrance to the Earth Tree. After we're victorious, finding the Earth Tree blocked by Radigan's thorns, Belena will appear before us again. She's discovered the truth of her purpose, to help us get inside the Earth Tree. And crucially, this could also explain why we are escorting Melina to Lanedale in the first place. If Marika is her mother, and she's returning to Lanedale to find the truth of her purpose, then her journey is to return to Marika inside the Earth Tree. The thorns are impenetrable, a husk of the Earth Tree's being that spurns all that exists without. The only way to stand before the Elden Ring and become the Elden Lord is to pass the thorns. My purpose serves to aid in that very act. In the end, this purpose leads to Marika being freed from her imprisonment by Radigan and the Elden Beast. If Marika gave her this task, and this task leads us to killing Radigan, then it makes sense to me that this was the mission all along. Marika gave this to her, knowing it would lead to a tarnished killing her captors and freeing her from her shackles. This goes completely against the Golden Order, which we know Melina is aware of from our very first interaction. One of her kind is sure to seek the Elden Ring, even if it does violate the Golden Order. This all ties in perfectly with the usurping theory and gives more answers to why Melina is on her quest with us. I don't want to claim that I'm the first person to think of this kind of idea for her backstory, and I have to admit, this whole scenario works without the Radigan Usurped Marika idea. I just think this is a fascinating part of the lore, and it does tie into the usurping theory really well. This way of thinking could also explain the secret task that Marika gave to Hugh. He promised her he'd create a weapon to slay a god. And, just like with Melina, it makes sense that Marika gave Hugh this mission to ultimately free her from her imprisonment. We know Hugh is devoted to this task. And when we hear him praying to Marika, it does look and sound like he's doing it out of love and devotion. Rodrika does call it a curse from Queen Marika, but I don't think it's a literal curse. Sorry if you haven't seen Naruto Shippuden, but a comparison to this would be how Sakura realises how stressful Naruto's promise to her has been on him. He completely devotes himself to bringing Sasuke back to the Hidden Leaf, and she realises it's like a figurative curse she's put on him. The mental and physical strain of the promise is like a metaphorical curse anime reference out the way, as we slay the demigods throughout the game, Hugh remains unsatisfied, so killing Radigan or the Elden Beast would be the real mission Marika gave to him. So I'm convinced that Marika gave Melina and Hugh their secret quests, knowing it would help free her from the Earth Tree. Whether by divine prophecy or sheer luck, this goal is ultimately successful. I know this is all speculation on my part, but I think this ties all these characters into the main story of the game in a consistent and gratifying way. I'm not sure exactly how many people believe she's the Glomide Queen, or if they think she's Radigan American's daughter, so I'd love it if you guys could let me know. This is one of your really great questions that I hadn't even considered before. And it's true, this question does create a bit of an issue for the Usurping Theory timeline. With Radigan sent to Lanedell to punish Marika for breaking the Elden Ring, then the Night of Black Knives would have already happened. Rani would have already lost her body before she and her brothers were made into demigods. So then, why on earth would she have a seat at the council around the throne in Lanedale? Well, you could also ask why would Rykard have a chair if he was straight up against the Erd Tree and the Golden Order? And why would Radan have a chair if he was straight up insane wandering around Kaelid? They are never seen beyond Morgoth's cutscene, so it's unclear what kind of mechanism makes them re- and dematerialize. One simple theory would be, Radigan naturally would elevate his own children to the council with him. There may have been symbols of their status, and they may have never actually sat in the chairs. There may have just been a chair for each of Marika's direct offspring. It's never explained if being a demigod is something born as or simply a title given. The demigods are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Marika. According to Google, the term direct offspring can be defined as a person who was born into or legally adopted into the direct line of an individual's descent. So, that means Radigan's own children with Renala are Marika's direct offspring, even though they are stepchildren. And along with Godfrey also being called a demigod, it seems more likely to be a title received. Now, a more complicated theory would be, the council could have been formed as part of the alliance between demigods during the first defence of Lanedale. The first defence of Lanedale, a sovereign alliance rots from within. Traces yet remain of bloody conspiracy. 
We are told aggravatingly little about the first and second defences of Laindale, including who was in this alliance. All we know is that Godfrey the Grafford was captured after the first defence, and the council could have indeed been created for this alliance. It was during the Shattering War, so after the Night of Black Knives, so Rani would have already lost her body. As we know, Rikard later fought against the armies of Laindale in Mount Gelmir, and Radan later fought Melina in Caelid, so this council has definitely been disbanded for a long time. But all these demigods still have a seat at the council, so they may just remain as figurative representations of the original alliance. It's interesting how small Rani's chair is compared to the others. We know from her corpse atop the Divine Tower of Leonia that Rani was a similar height to Melina, if not taller. So why is her chair so much smaller? Does this mean her chair was made for her dull form? Well, Chidan would also be way too big for his chair, but we don't know when or why he grew so large, so he may have just been a regular sized demigod during the alliance. As you can tell, this is a tricky question to answer, with or without the usurping theory. And if you try and look deeper into the history, you'll always find there's far less information than we first realise. I love questions like this, they get me looking closer into details of the lore that I've completely missed before. I honestly didn't even realise there were two defences of Laindell. I'll keep looking into this one to try and find more conclusive evidence, so if anyone has anything to add to this one, please don't hesitate to let me know. And please keep sending in your amazing questions. So there are many, many more questions that I'd love to go over, but there's just too many to fit into one video. I haven't even touched the Mask of Confidence, or the Golden Order Greatsword, or how the twins would have gotten their great runes, or how the twins might even be clones. The biggest question I still want to talk about has to be, is Radigan a silver or mimic tier? Cosmos covered this in amazing detail over a year ago, so it's definitely not a new theory, but since I uploaded the first video, I've seen a lot of people discussing this idea. Many people are still skeptical, but I think it has a lot of potential. There are very small details in particular from a Simi's Cut questline that I feel make this idea extremely interesting. Hello, other you. I really want to go over this in full detail in a future video, and I think I'd have enough for a whole video just on Radigan's origins, if that's something people want that is. And on that note, I have to ask all of you to send me any of your thoughts and theories about anything I've covered in this video. I'm just a guy who came up with a wild theory, but you guys made this follow-up video even possible. All your ideas are truly an amazing resource, and I really am touched that so many of you connected with the theory. Many of you disagreed with the usurping theory, but still shared your kind words, and so much encouragement that I can't ever thank you enough. Making these videos has been pretty damn challenging, but an absolute blast. Again, I'd love to make more of these, and it really does turn out that liking and subbing do make a huge difference. I, f I feel weird asking, but anything to help the algorithm would really go a long way. With that, once again, I have to say that all my speculations could be wrong about everything in this video, and I know there's going to be so much that I've missed. I'm hoping some of you will want to see more of these questions answered, and I'm hoping you guys will have even more questions to talk about. Thanks again to anyone who stuck all the way through this one, but I think that's all I've got for this one. And, um, yeah, I really have no idea how to sign off at the end.